All right. We'll get you to turn to Ephesians 2. Just while I give the introduction, I'm going to keep you here forever today, but I'm just going to have a few thoughts. There is a, seems to be an eternal debate in psychological fields. Can you hear me okay out there? Yes, yes, okay. Um, this debate in a, regarding how genetics versus the environment or your environment affect how a person de uh, develops in their lifetime. It's often referred to as nature versus nurture. You may have heard of it. You may have heard of it in a completely different thing. There are opposing schools of thought on how this works. Some uh, suggest that your genetic makeup, the things that make you physically you are the things that will, uh, you know, these characteristics that determine who you become, how tall you might be, the color of your eyes, color of your hair, color of your skin, your personality, some of the traits that you might have. And, uh, you know, this going back to the ancient Greeks who were saying, this is the stuff that makes you, you, regardless of where you are, you will become what you're always going to become. The other side of that is, uh, the environment that you uh, are brought up in, the upbringing you have, the teaching that you receive, the family life that you may or might not have, good or bad, is, will determine how you progress through life. So, you know, childhood experiences, social relationships, um, your behaviour, how you react to things, the things that you have access to, whether you have access to a good education or you might be brought up in a place that has none of that. Whatever it is, the food that you might have access to, the shelter, the safety, the security. This is the other side of the argument, which has been around for a while. So there's nothing, nothing new under the sun here. And then there's these days, there's sort of the middle ground where people think, oh, it's, it's, it's a combination of all these things, which makes a lot of sense. But I'm not here to talk about things that do or don't make a lot of sense philosophically. It's just there to demonstrate that there are different factors that come in to make you who you are and where you are. What I really want to talk about, though, is that when we receive the Holy Spirit, when we are born again, these natural abilities, characteristics, what we have, environments that we might have been brought up in, they no longer define who we are. They no longer make up what we are because we are a new creation. And simple. We have the new nature, the nature of God. And along with that, we have you know, a better environment to be in, one that is the household of God, we read in the scriptures, one that cares and nurtures and looks after its people. <laughs> My watch. So I know what the time is. Right. So let's just turn to a few scriptures. Uh, you're in Ephesians 2. I'm going to read a verse out of 2 Corinthians 5. Verse 17 says, and this is a you know, fundamental one. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. In Romans 12, 2, we would read, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And we're in Ephesians 2. Hopefully, uh, pick it up in verse 19. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens of the saint, with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, and Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also builded together for an, an habitation of God through the Spirit. All these things, we're, we're, a new we're a new creature. We're not conformed to this world, but we're transformed in our minds. We are now fellow citizens, fitly framed and joined and built together. That's not the individual thing that you've been brought up to be and that you're a sort of the person with blue eyes and dark hair who I was always going to be. I'm a new creation, fit together in the household of God, this whole thing that's all come together. I'm talking with my hands too. It must be, must be Italian day. 
when you're filled with the Spirit, the natural thinking takes a back seat and you're, you're renewed. The, the, um, the Amplified says you're, you're renovated. Oh, I they're kind of renovated. We just, we just did our bathroom and you know, it just sprung to, sprung to mind. The old bathroom is gone and the new one is there. That's the thing that the Lord's given you. He's given you that new, that new renovation in your mind that it's new. It's a different thinking. It's refreshed. And it's that so we can align ourselves with God because the natural mind can't do it. We, and we fit in with each other in the body of Christ, in the work of the Lord, because it's an environment that, that cares. It's the environment that will look after you. All right, let's turn to Romans 8. Great, great chapter, Romans 8. And a couple of verses here. Verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded or naturally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life, and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man has not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. This is why we're renewed in our minds. This is why when the Holy Spirit comes in, it's, it's different. It's a different way of seeing things, of appreciating things, of understanding things, because the natural man we just read can't do it. It is in opposition to God, the natural man. It's, it's one way or the other way. You know, the Lord says, my ways are higher than your ways. If they're higher, they're above it. They're not on the same level. They're not the same thinking. It's not the same appreciation. If you don't have the spirit of God, we just read, then you're not, you're none of his. But when you have it, the spiritual mind is life and it's peace. Let's turn to uh, Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, verse 22, I think, yes. There's a lot more that you can read and do read. Ephesians, you know, Romans 8 is great. Ephesians 4 is good here. I'm going to pick verse 22. That you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you might put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Again, here's that encouragement to put off the old man, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Let the Lord come into you and fill you and, and, and do things for you because the spirit allows us to move on from the old stuff that we had, the natural approaches, the natural understanding, and to see things in a way that God wants us to see them and to be able to do them. That's why he made the spirit available because the law that was there clearly showed how we couldn't. Not that the law wasn't perfect. We were just not able to attain it. That's what the, what Paul tells us. But you know, this is why he's made the spirit available so we can see the difference. We can see the good from the evil. We can see the natural ways from the ways God wants us to go and to do have the chance to follow what is right and what is just. Again, the benefit of this is life and peace. And, you know, when you, when you see these, you look up the meaning, the meaning for life, when you click it on the Amplified, is life. It's being alive, it's living, it's, you know, having, actually having something, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. Because the carnal way is death. The natural way will only lead to death. Hand in hand with God's direction is God's love. In fact, it's 
the same thing. The way he set up the church to look after each other, to look after its members, to care for those who are around us, you know, to, to, to outreach, to spread the word, to see souls saved. That's love. That's what God's done. We've got the, the nature of God. We've also got the nurture of God. Nature and nurture is the title of my talk, if you're looking for, for a heading. Let's turn to Hebrews 10. Not because you don't know them. It's good to hear them. And being able to put it into practice. Hebrews 10 verse 23 says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Let us consider uh, one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And it would be remiss of the preacher to read that word out now and not say we all see the day approaching because all the things that are happening around this world, the day is approaching. It might not be tomorrow. It may well be tonight, you know, the way things can go, but it's coming. We should provoke one another to love and to good works, to not forsake being here, to not all of a sudden have somewhere to be or something that I forgot to do. If you forgot to do something, guess what? It still won't be done by the end of the meeting. It won't matter if you don't do it now. But if you're here and you put the Lord first, which we are doing, all those who are here, all those who are pixels on the screen up there, we're all... We're all not forsaking the gathering together, but we're being part of it, we're being provoked to be part of it. Provoke, you know, I think of, I provoke someone, I'm trying to get a reaction from them. Mark's starting the Mexican wave for me at the back. <laughs> Is it when the lights go off, I have to stop? First Thessalonians. Thessalonians in chapter 5. For time, I won't read out the whole thing. But verse 1 says, But the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. So there we go. There it is again. We know what's going on. Down into verse uh, 6. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep... Sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. Let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and from helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labour among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. What I like about that, it, it tells you the things that you need to do. But it also tells you that we're all together needing to do this together. Because it says, uh, let us not sleep doesn't say don't sleep. I mean, it does, because that's what it implies. But it says, let us not sleep. The fellowship, the body of Christ, the environment that we're in, that the Lord's placed us in, the fellowship. Don't sleep. Don't fall asleep. Don't slacken off. Don't take your foot off the pedal. Don't do all these analogies. Be vigilant. Provoke each other to be vigilant. If someone's dropping off, nodding off next to you, Provoke them. Like Sam was just being provoked by his sister with a pencil there. Let us encourage each other because we're here and to appreciate what we have and to you know, to know them which labour among you 
and are over you and the Lord and admonish you. Listen to the instruction. We have two, we have two pastors here. If you can't listen to some instruction there, I mean, you know, what are we doing? We've got great wisdom and, and benefit that comes from the leadership that we have, and that comes from the scriptures, and that is inspired by the Spirit. It all works together to build us up. So be attentive and you know, take, take it on board. Do something about it. Be involved in it. Uh, we'll go back to Ephesians. I could have just read out of Ephesians. I could have done the whole course. Ephesians 6, verse 1 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honour thy father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayst live long on the earth. That's that life that we get from the Spirit that we just read about. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. So we have to provoke, but not in a bad way. Not in a way that is me venting. But, uh, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. There's the nurture. We had the new nature of God, and we have the nurturing of the Lord. The, the care, you know, the admonition, the, the direction, the encouragement, the, the disciplining, if you like, the things that go, no, don't do that. That's not good for you. This is good for you. Don't slacken off. That's not good for you. This is good for you. Right, let me read John, John 15. There's a lot of things you can go through. Isn't there? At the end of John, you know, you, you, you think that a talk can go long. John says, I suppose that even the world itself can, cannot contain the books that should be written about Jesus. Yeah, so be thankful that it's only the one book we're reading from. Imagine trying to read the whole world. No wonder someone fell out of the sleep in the window when Paul was preaching. John 15, verse 1 says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purges, purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. You are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me, you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. You know, like, you know, all, all that coming in together, it's an us. Gathering together, do not forsaking the gathering of ourselves together. It's in us that we're being edified and brought up. It's the environment in us, not just people standing in this, sitting in this whole, the whole body of Christ working together. If we abide not in the Lord, if we try to do it our own way, we're cast off. We get gathered up. You know, the world will come along and scoop this up and put you in the fire. But if you follow with the Lord and you are in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, pruning off the little bits and here and there, that's when we bear more fruit. That's when we grow. The nurturing of God is placing us in fellowship with people who believe the same thing. We share the same experience as the Holy Spirit, united in their walk in the Lord. And that enables us to encourage each other. That enables us to stir up good works, to grow in faith and wisdom, to be you know, overflowing with the Spirit, not just have the Spirit in us, but it's bubbling up. You get involved, it works, it moves, it does things. The more you do it, the more it does that. 
but it also disciplines us, corrects us, trims away the rough edges, cuts away the bits that don't need to be there. So you, you, you bear more fruit. We have a bunch of big rose bushes in front of our house. And they've got flowers everywhere sometimes. And they fall over. Sometimes you come out after a windy night and they're on the grounds because they've been weak and they didn't need to be there. Trim the rose bush, get the good, get the good produce, the good roses from it, the good flowers. Cut away the rough edges, and make something, you get rid of the thorns and, and make it all good. So the results of God's new nature and nurturing, they're, they're manifest in us by this, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the love, the joy, the peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. I almost ran out of fingers. Quite. I always used to tell the kids I have 11 fingers. One, two, three, four, five, ten, nine, eight, seven, six. Five and six is 11. <laughs> you, can't, you, can, you can't argue that. The fruit of the Spirit, the values that the world can't, can't live up to, can't obtain, they might have a little bit of joy. They might have a little bit of peace. They may have a bit of love. They don't have it all, and they won't have it all. But we can, we do, because we are in the Lord. We, we have this nurturing of the Lord. We have this new nature from the Lord, this new thinking, this new, uh, this new spirit within us. We have a willingness to be part of the work of the Lord. I think that's, you know, that's an important thing to do, because if you don't have that willingness, if you can't drag yourself out of bed, you know, on a Sunday morning to be here, are you really willing to be following the Lord? You can't build up the the bother to get to a meeting on a Tuesday night because you're tired and it's a long, it's been a long day. Get it? Sometimes it happens. Well, I've never been to a meeting that I've regretted going to. Never once. You grow up as a you know, and you start working and some days are just terrible. But we have this refreshing of the Lord. You make the effort, the Lord will bless it. You'll be filled with the Spirit and you will show it. It's long suffering a bit sometimes. I'm going to finish in Second Peter chapter one. In fact, I'm going to read it out of the Amplified, so I won't turn to it. Second Peter one. to know that we are different from the world because we have a new nature we have this nurturing we're a new creation so let's follow along in here but in the amplified just put some really nice things there verse 2 says may god's sorry may grace of god's favor and favor and peace which is perfect well-being all necessary good all spiritual prosperity freedom from fears and agitating passions and moral conflicts be multiplied to you in the full personal, precise, and correct knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. There's a lot of words in the Amplified, so I might skip over some of them as we go. But his divine power has bestowed upon us all things that are requisite and suited to life and godliness through the full personal knowledge of him who called us by and to his own glory and excellence or his virtue. By means of these, he has bestowed upon us his precious and exceedingly great promises so that through them you may escape by flight, run away from the moral decay, the rottenness and corruption that is in the world because of covetousness, lust and greed, and become partakers or sharers of the divine nature. We've just been talking about this divine nature. We've been run away from the world because that's what the Lord has shown you and come to the Lord be part of this divine nature. It all makes a lot of sense. For this very reason, adding to your diligence for the divine promises, employ every effort in exercising your faith to develop virtue or excellence or resolution. And in exercising virtue, knowledge, intelligence. In exercising knowledge, develop self-control. In exercising that self-control, develop steadfastness or patience, endurance. And in exercising steadfastness, Develop godliness. 
the exercise in godliness, brotherly affection, brotherly affection, charity, so it's a Christian love, love of Christ. For as these qualities are yours and increasingly abound in you, they will keep you from being idle or unfruitful to the full personal knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're a new creation. Go away from the world. Run away from it, it says. Go flight from the, the corruption that is there, the moral decay. It's pretty aptly put there, the rottenness. You think the Ballarat Council was bad? They, they, they rest on their laurels a little bit or they, they sit back and take the moral high, the, the, the corrupted moral high ground. Well, this is the world. Don't worry about that. Leave it. Show the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit, that is, manifest through the nurturing of God, through the new nature that we have, through the Holy Spirit, through the fellowship that we're in. All these things, be involved, be partakers, be here, be part of it. So, amen. <laughs>